Welcome to the Policy Insights Forum of Samuel Associates. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Admiral Mark Norman. Welcome, Admiral. Well, Dr. Tyon Paul, my friend, thank you uh, for inviting me. And more importantly, thank you for your interest in naval affairs and specifically um, in the uh, issues facing uh, Canada's Navy. Thank you. I would like to begin our discussion, Admiral, with a question that most Canadians need to appreciate. Why does Canada need a Navy? Well, it's a great question. It's a multi-billion dollar question uh, these days. And uh, I guess I could be flippant and simply say that uh, Canada needs a Navy because we're surrounded on three sides by water, uh, vast amounts of it. But it's a little more nuanced than that. There's a variety of reasons why uh, different countries have navies. But ultimately, it's it's about controlling your maritime estate. Um, and really what that means is it's about controlling the water uh, on your coasts and the access and, uh, um, if you will, uh, approaches uh, to that territorial um, ocean space. And of course, you know, being such a vast country, um, we have a lot of maritime state. Um, and But in addition to just looking after things um, in our own neighborhood, if you will, and, and uh, we have to forget that we have a very important neighbor to the south. Um, and uh, a lot of Canadians see um, our geography through that land border. Um, but we also have um, obligations internationally, and a Navy provides uh, Canada with uh, the ability to deploy forces when they're required um, to basically anywhere in the world. Now, that's an oversimplification. There's a lot more to that. But I think if your listeners and viewers just keep in mind, navies are designed to control water in the same way that you would use a police force to control roads and you would use an army to control territory and you use an air force to control airspace, you use navies to control water. And that means basically um, deciding who comes into your water um, and under what conditions. The Royal Canadian Navy has performed superbly despite the resource constraints it faces. However, it cannot effectively perform forever without proper support. Governments have a responsibility to maintain an effective, capable military and fund it in ways that meet the defense requirements for decades to come. As a former commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, what operational needs do you see as wanting right now? Well, I think uh, there's a variety of challenges facing the Canadian forces writ large, but specifically to the Navy. Um, and I would suggest these are these are applicable to the other services as well, but we're talking about the Navy. Um, the first problem would be um, a serious lack of uh, personnel. Uh, the second problem would be um, an aging fleet, um, both surface and subsurface um, ships and submarines. And I guess the third problem, which arguably would be the first problem, if we were looking at this strategically, is a, um, a, a multi-generational continued lack of um, appreciation of the significance of investment that is required to maintain a modern and capable armed forces. And this spans multiple governments. Um, and in essence, uh, what we're dealing with today in 2023 is the result of a series of risk management decisions over the preceding decades that have resulted in um, an under-equipped, understaffed, um, and uh, rapidly um, aging uh, Navy. Now, there have been significant announcements and investments made to build new capabilities, but that's fundamentally where we find ourselves um, today in 2023. As a country with the longest coastline in the world, 
and an enormous offshore territory, Canada needs a continuous strategic commitment that spans government's mandate to keep a credible maritime security force in a place of high priority in spending terms. The Royal Canadian Navy, the Coast Guard and the RCMP are collectively responsible for safety and security and sovereignty of Canadian waters, plus those of our allied and aligned countries. That said, do we as a nation lack the strategic vision to understand our ocean-going operational and defence requirements and responsibilities? Well, I think the short answer is sadly yes, but I need to um, explain that and unpack it to a certain degree. Um, I think the way you laid out the context of the question is very useful in that it, it acknowledges the fact that um, the Royal Canadian Navy doesn't operate um, in isolation. It doesn't operate in a bubble. And in the context of Canadian safety and security, it operates with key partners. That includes the Coast Guard. It includes the RCMP. And there's a variety of others, border services, et cetera, et cetera, um, fisheries and oceans. Um, it, it, it's definitely a team sport. And everybody has slightly different mandates and slightly different responsibilities which are specific to Canada. There's parallels in um, other countries around the world. Uh, or some of our allies have similar um, structures as well. But fundamentally, what we do in Canada is, is specific to Canada. Now, with that said, um, the, the premise of your question is that there's a lack of vision. And I think this goes back to the previous comment where um, it's certainly clear to me through my career and as a, an interested and engaged observer since I retired, that um, my, my sense is that we tend in Canada, at least, to um, have a couple of default behaviors. The first default behavior would be that um, we um, only invest the bare minimum necessary um, to get whatever tick in the box is required. So if the tick in the box is that we're being seen to be making a minimal investment in defense, then that's what we do. If the tick in the box is seen to be uh, whatever the political agenda is of the day, then that's what we do. But we aren't necessarily committed strategically, certainly in the context of defense and security, to a fundamental um, embracing of um, why security and defense are necessary and uh, why the massive investments, and they are massive, but nobody's denying that these are enormous uh, numbers that we're dealing with are required. I think that's the first sort of um, behavior. The, the second behavior is that we tend to, um, uh, I used the word in a previous response, uh, we tend to risk management, these, to risk manage these decisions, which in many respects means we put them off until there's uh, some sort of crisis. Um, we don't buy new things until the old things are uh, basically, um, you know, uh, either no longer seaworthy, they've rusted out, uh, whatever language you want to use. And, um, and of course, that creates problems in and of itself because it, it uh, means that whatever the procurement is, it's under a time pressure um, which then creates, uh, you know, in escalation and cost, et cetera, et cetera. And we just kind of perpetuate this, this uh, systemic behavior of um, they're almost Band-Aid solutions. Um, we're not really behaving and thinking strategically. We're just going, we, we create these problems because of our lack of action. And then we um, kind of ad hoc and crisis manage our way through whatever the, the problem is that's been created. Um, and the third thing, and I think this is kind of one of the foundational problems in, in Canadian defense and security discussion, is that we continue to believe naively that we live in um, this uh, so-called fireproof house uh, that has been uh, referred to uh, for decades uh, here in Canada, whereby there really isn't a threat. Um, and, and that to me is fundamentally flawed. Um, and certainly here we are today um, in, uh, in February talking about 
bizarre airborne threats to uh, North America that nobody can explain, while we have a uh, very disturbing and highly um, lethal war uh, playing out in, in Ukraine. And I guess some could argue, well, those aren't really issues that Canadians need to be concerned about. Well, they are, not because um, there's there's a boogeyman at the door, but because these are, uh, in one case, these are our, our interests that are being threatened. And in the other case, these are, this is our actual physical um, security and sovereignty that, that's being challenged um, by somebody uh, for, for whatever reason. So that's a long way uh, of saying, um, sadly, yes, we do lack a sense of vision. We tend to operate on um, uh, sort of repeated election cycles. Um, the politicization of defense in this country is, is both um, disturbing and um, ill-informed. Um, it, it often is not an issue that resonates with the Canadian public, and I understand that. It shouldn't have to resonate with the Canadian public. If uh, It's the kind of thing that Canadians should be able to sleep soundly knowing that their security and defense is looked after. But when it does become an issue, um, it, it's, it's not a particularly productive discussion, and uh, it tends to focus on whatever the next political cycle, which typically is an election cycle. And defense and security um, is a much more long-term strategic conversation than a four- to five-year cycle. And I think that that's been part of our problem, and that's why we have some of the challenges we have today. A subsidiary to that, would, would it be fair to say that successive Canadian governments have not delivered predictable long-term funding for the Royal Canadian Navy? And secondly, some analysts have argued that the inadequacies within our fleet are examples of the unfortunate link between a dearth of investment and our capability gaps. Yeah, okay, so I mean, you've got two, I think, very important dimensions of, of the problem. And to give the direct answer first and then hopefully expand on it um, with some, some detail, the answer is um, yes, it is true. Um, and this goes back to what I was mentioning a few minutes ago, whereby we have repeated cycles of um, what can be best described as political expediency uh, related to uh, whatever the decisions are that needed to be made at a certain point in time. Um, and long-term funding, uh, the stability of long-term funding is really important because you can't build um, a plan for investment uh, if you can't rely on the streams of funding that are coming in. Now, successive governments will argue that, you know, one government's done a better job than the other, or this, you know, current government has committed to long-term stable funding, et cetera, et cetera. And, and th to some degree, the, the claims are valid, but they don't, they don't address the significance of the issue. The bottom line is that demand uh, has consistently and arguably always will outstrip supply. So um, then, then the government is faced with some serious decisions around how much is enough. Um, and the, one of the problems with defense uh, budgeting and defense spending is that um, it is extremely expensive. And uh, trying to apply um, private sector or public other public sector models to um, inflation, for example, uh, are just not useful. Um, Defense-specific inflation is significantly higher than any other sector uh, in any modern economy. And uh, the reality is that uh, governments are not willing to allocate the kinds of um, funding or protection against inflation that would be necessary for um, the, the dollars to be protected. I mean, Canadians can understand this in their own personal lives. As the cost of living goes up, your buying power goes down. And this, this is a reality in defense spending. And uh, it's never been properly addressed. And notwithstanding, and, I, and I'm fully sympathetic to the sticker shock associated with a number of these major procurements, but notwithstanding the enormous amounts of money, 
the reality is that um, the, the there's insufficient funds going forward, not just to buy the stuff, but to own and operate it um, over uh, extended periods of time. And I guess the second element of that I touched on in the previous answer, and, and that relates to um, the the willingness uh, to commit beyond um, whatever the 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 horizon is of the decision makers, and often the horizon of the decision makers is well beyond um, those of the planners who are looking at multi generational capability. So when you look, when you consider, for example, the, the the backbone of the Royal Canadian Navy on the surface right now, which are twelve frigates that were built in the early nineties, uh, they were built for roughly a thirty year life cycle, um, and uh, we're now well into the thirty year life cycle. Uh, in many cases, uh, the early ships are now past thirty years of age. Um, and the replacements are literally a decade plus um, uh, on the horizon. They haven't even been, the design hasn't been finalized yet, and there's lots of uh, reporting and acrimony associated with the costs, and, and that's a whole other debate. But the issue is that these are the kinds of problems that then just make things worse. So now you end up spending billions of dollars while you wait for a new capability to come online. And, and this is referred to frequently as boom and bust um, cycles. And shipbuilding in particular is susceptible to these cycles. You, you can't ramp up the kind of industrial capacity that you need to build sophisticated warships um, overnight. And once you get it, if you don't sustain it and continue to use it, well, guess what? It will atrophy. Um, and and uh, the, the the private sector does not operate as on charitable status, so they're not going to continue to do something which is not economically viable. And this is what we've seen. Uh, we we have a history in Canada of building um, world class capabilities, shutting down the uh, industrial capacity, and then uh, waiting until. Uh, you know, somebody says there's a crisis and we have to replace what we have. And then that typically takes way too long and that just drags out the problem. So, I mean, at the risk of rambling, I think the premise of your question uh, had multiple dimensions, but those two key dimensions in particular uh, are are valid. Um, and, and this is sadly uh, where we find ourselves today. Admiral, as you know, uh, NATO has called for member states to improve the quality of their naval fleets and underwater surveillance capabilities. That requires starting the process of replacing Victoria-class submarines with new boats. Some analysts have argued for a far more enhanced under-ice capability while concomitantly uh, recommending increasing the size of our, our submarine fleet from 14 to 12 submarines. The objective being in the future that the Royal Canadian Navy would be capable of effectively operating subs in Canada's Arctic, the North Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and in conjunction with our friends and allies. Considering sovereignty issues and our responsibilities, as you pointed out, could this be a viable course of action for the Canadian government and the RCN? Oh, well, let's start with the end of your question. Um, could it be viable? Absolutely. It, it, is it um, is it going to be uh, politically palatable? Um, I guess that depends on where you're sitting. I think if we look at this domestically in the context of um, the current government and the challenges they're facing, there will be a lot of pressure um, to reduce defense spending um, and, uh, and, and, and the potential impacts that will have on the existing program plus anything else that um, defense would look to put into the program. So that would include submarines. So I think domestically submarines will, will be a challenge just simply from a programmatic perspective. Uh, internationally, however, I think it would be very difficult for this government um, to defend a decision to not uh, recapitalize um, Canada's underwater uh, capability, um, especially in the context of um, ongoing concerns about the defense of North America um, here close to home or in our own backyard and uh, the expectations um, 
and responsibilities that are on us as members of NATO, as you laid out in your question. So, so that's that's the tail end of your question, but the 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 beginning and the middle of the question had a lot in there, and so I mean, fundamentally, we're we're talking about a few things here. We're talking about how does Canada um, meet its uh, obligations? How does it satisfy its allies with respect to, again, as I said earlier, how much is enough? If you're not inclined to believe in the need for defense or want to spend money on defense, which arguably is part of our culture here in Canada, then um, you start the conversation with how much do we have to do to get away with doing just enough? Um, so uh, and then we're talking about the specifics of the what in naval terms we call the underwater domain, the subsurface domain, um, the role that submarines play in that. Um, and and uh, the fact that, that this is an area, um, not just in Canada, but it's an area that has been underinvested in uh, for the last couple of decades. And there's, there's, there's valid reasons for that uh, when you look at it historically, um, that, you know, since the end of the Cold War and, and the, uh, the Gulf War and those uh, significant events, we look at the events in and around uh, Yugoslavia in the 90s. We look at um, actions around Libya um, in the, the previous decade, uh, those sorts of things. The, the, those were not um, uh, open ocean, blue water, uh, deep water, um, anti-submarine warfare activities. So the, so the premise was that that, uh, that shift in the way navies were operating um, had caused a atrophy uh, across um, NATO and elsewhere with respect to submarine capability. So um, Canada is as much a victim of that as any other country. The problem we have here, it goes back to your opening question with respect to just the sheer scale of the maritime problem we have in Canada. So uh, can we be excused for being uh, just as guilty as anybody else in the last couple of decades is not uh, paying enough attention to uh, anti-submarine warfare and underwater warfare. Yeah, we could, um, but we have a much bigger problem than most other most other countries, uh, just from pure geography alone. And then you add the complexity, as you did in your question, to um, Canada's maritime estate, uh, a third of which, arguably, is uh, partly solid. Uh, for most of the year, um, so how do you how do you develop a coherent strategy for dealing with that? Well, submarines have to be part of that. I go back to why you have a navy. You have a navy to control water, um, and you control water from the surface to the seabed. You can't just control water on the surface. Um, and uh, submarines are a vital capability for exercising. Um, the kind of control that I'm, I'm referring to and alluding to. Um, it would be akin to uh, a police force arguing that they control the streets, but there's a whole subterranean um, uh, um, ecosystem uh, under, under the surface of the roads uh, that allows people to maneuver freely. Um, and, and the police are just fooling themselves if they think they're actually controlling the streets. I, uh, I'm trying to come up with an analogy that, that you know, listeners might be able to get their heads around. Um, so uh, then the question around submarines becomes, okay, um, well, um, if you can accept the premise that you need them, and some people can and some people can't, then how many do you need? Well, submarines are are very complicated systems, um, and even a brand new modern submarine uh, can only operate for so long and so far. Um, it has limitations. It has crewing limitations. It has um, other physical limitations on the actual vessel itself, um, and you can't operate them uh, in perpetuity. They have to be maintained. So uh, somewhere in the order of a ratio of three or four to one, um, and it depends. It depends on which submarine and what the operating conditions are, et cetera. Um, three submarines gets three or four submarines gets you one submarine all the time. Um, 
And uh, and that's the kind of problem we've been dealing with uh, for the last couple of decades when we bought the used submarines from the UK. We never got them to a state where we could rely uh, consistently on having um, that kind of availability. So if you were to accept the premise that you need a submarine in each of our oceans, um, and oh, by the way, they don't go very fast, and these are enormous distances. So you're not going to reposition a submarine easily from Halifax to Victoria or from Victoria to um, uh, the approaches to uh, the, the, the Arctic Ocean, for example. So having three uh, available uh, would lead you to need somewhere in the order of 9 to 12, depending on your math. And what will those submarines or what should those submarines be capable of doing? I think um, the issue of under ice capability um, does uh, appeal to many Canadians. I think it's a legitimate reaction. But at the same time, uh, realistically, um, a conventional submarine, even the latest and greatest and most modern of uh, um, hybrid um, air independent capability um, is not going to allow you to operate under the ice, uh, certainly for uh, 12 months of the year. Um, the whole nuclear submarine debate uh, has played out twice in our history. It hasn't gone well. Um, I'm not suggesting that that, that, that is the right solution. Um, I think we need to have a um, mature and sophisticated conversation about it. Um, it is a very inflammatory and emotive subject, um, but I think ultimately Canada can make an enormous contribution to continental and international security by having a very capable non-nuclear submarine fleet that can support our friends who operate nuclear submarines. And um, therefore, I would see key roles being, um, in a continental context at least, um, patrolling and defending the approaches um, to the uh, ice cap, but not necessarily operating uh, directly under the ice cap. I don't think that's a feasible scenario for Canada. But if we're not prepared to have the conversation and discuss the pros and cons and merits of that approach, then I, I fear that uh, um, this will all get lost in the noise. So, so there's lots to talk about there, uh, Dr. Paul, but. Uh, I, I think I'll just leave it at that. Admiral, uh, with the threats, the threats emanating today from China and Russia to our national interests, along with those of our Pacific and Atlantic uh, friends and allies, combined with the return of great power competition, does Canada need to formulate a new defense strategy? Um, I'm going to... I'm going to be a bit controversial and say no. Um, and the, the problem with, well, first of all, arguably, we don't necessarily have a defense strategy. It's not explicit. Um, it's uh, more implied and um, precedent-based. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We do have uh, defense policy statements, but policies in and of themselves are not strategies nor are they plans. Um, they're simply expressions of, of government intent. Um, but over our, I'll call it modern history, um, it's been relatively consistent. Uh, and, and the differences, to be honest, are probably um, uh, less significant than we imagine. Uh, and, and so um, the, you know, the, the three recurring themes are um, you know, defense of Canada, defense of North America, and, you know, contributions to international peace and security. Um, and, and, and they're all modified slightly. The verbs and nouns change a little bit um, based on uh, the timing and the, the political um, bent uh, of, of the government of the day. But fundamentally, they've never changed. So, so let's, if we accept that as a intellectual promise. Let's look at um, the, the, the key elements of your question, which is um, the 
you know, a re, re-emerging Russia um, and a emerging and uh, not to be fooled with China. Um, so, uh, and, and they're different. Uh, and they present different problems and they present different threats. Um, I mean, Russia, a little more traditional um, uh, threat in the context of our Cold War history. Um, they are in our neighborhood directly, uh, you know, arguably they live across the street. Um, now, most Canadians don't think of it that way because they don't, they're not looking out their front window and thinking they live across the street, but they, they do, uh, if we consider the Arctic Ocean to be a, a really big street that we we live on, we back onto. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, obviously, the, the, the actions that we're observing in the Ukraine, their uh, rapid and aggressive growth of Arctic capabilities uh, under Putin in the last few years, um, their continued aggression and uh, technical um expansion as it relates to um, airborne threats to North America, um, submarine missile capabilities, uh, all these kinds of things would logically lead us to to have to recognize and and overtly uh, acknowledge Russia as as a threat. I mean, they never went away. They just sort of changed their game. And and now we're seeing uh, how it's playing out. So it's real and, and we need to take it seriously. Um, so is it a threat to Canada? Is it a physical threat to Canada? Okay. That's the one where you could probably, is Russia going to, so this is what happens. So you have these discussions. People will then give you ridiculous scenarios. Is Russia going to invade Canada? They're probably not going to invade Canada. They might probe and they might do this. We're seeing it all the time that there's incursions and, and, uh, and tests, uh, of our defensive systems on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, you know, defense of North America. Well, absolutely. Um, we sit between Russia and the United States. We can't ignore it. We can't avoid it. Um, and we have responsibilities as far as that concern. We can't just we can't just pretend that uh, it doesn't affect us because it does. Um, and and we need to um, have a robust capability to know what's going on uh, in our approaches to know. Um, when something is or isn't a threat, and we need to be a reliable and dependable partner to the United States. And we're seeing that play out right now in the news as as we deal with these mysterious objects uh, that are being intercepted by NORAD. So there, there's a view of Russia from the context of continental defense. And international peace and security, is it a threat? Is Russia a threat? Absolutely. Um, if anybody had any question whatsoever, the, uh, the events of the last uh, 12 months uh, in Ukraine um, should convince even the, the most ardent naysayer that Russia is a threat to the international system. So there's Russia. Um, now, China. Um, I, I think the same argument applies, but for, for different reasons. Um, China has long-term ambitions with respect to the entire uh, geostrategic system. Um, the, the, this is not a territorial issue specifically, although they have um, territorial ambitions uh, related to the South China Sea and Taiwan specifically, and those are topics of, of, of discussions for another day. But they have a history of um, uh, embarrassment uh, historically, uh, from a military perspective, they have been invaded, they have been attacked um, in their history, and they have long memories, and they're never going to let this happen again. And they believe that the um, the Western system of both uh, politics and economics that Canada and all of our friends and allies have prospered under for the last 80-some eh, years um, – is a fundamentally flawed system and they don't want any part of it and they want to create their own system and they want to be at the center of that system. Well, um, that should scare the living crap out of people. And I think what's starting to happen, certainly in a Canadian context, is they're starting to see um, episodic indicators of behavior that concerns them about China. Um but it's deeper than that, and and it is um, 
certainly uh, a threat to um, our way of life. And so um, these are things that we need to take seriously, but they don't fundamentally change the, the, the three principles of, of uh, Canadian defense strategy, which is defend our territory, reliable and, and um, dependable partner in the, in the shared defense of uh, the continent, and um, international peace and security. And they're both threats to all three of those uh, layers, if you will. What we need to do is we need to start acting seriously. We need to start thinking uh, about these problems uh, beyond just uh, the episodic uh, and and um, intermittent indicators, and we need to start thinking the long game, uh, which means we have to think and behave beyond uh, five-year election cycles, and we need to start looking at where our interests lie 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, and what are we going to do to protect them? Thank you for that. There's been a, uh, for a number of years, there's been a call for a credible strategic sea lift fleet of landing helicopter dock assault vessels designed essentially for rapid deployment domestically or globally. These would be able uh, and capable of conducting humanitarian assistance and disaster relief beyond Canada's uh, shores. And it is a critical requirement, in my view, for the Royal Canadian Navy. Now, the Royal Canadian Navy would then be well positioned to contribute domestic, uh, uh, contribute meaningfully to the domestic issues uh, ashore and to support the sustainment of joint operations from the sea while preserving the ability to defend Canada through naval operations. An amphibious sea lift capability would make Canada a more reliable contributor to national and international operations. To many, this would be a natural complement to our fleet while enhancing our defense capabilities. Why has Canada not adopted this strategic capability like so many of our allies? Or is this a capability not fully appreciated by the government? Well, I think, um, again, to react to how you finished the question first, and then I'll go back and, and, uh, and tackle some of the some of the important points in your question. Um, I, I think fundamentally, um, you kind of answered the question yourself in the sense that there's, it's, I'll paraphrase, it, it's an appetite uh, problem. Um, and it comes back to this recurring theme of how much is enough. And um, from a uh, professional and uh, overall capability perspective, as you said in your question, it makes a lot of sense. So let, let's just let's just take a second here and, and, and unpack all this. So one of the great things about navies uh, is they can go uh, very long distances and they can sustain themselves at sea for very long periods of time. So they give you um, reach and they give you um, sustained presence, either 12 miles off your own shore, if that's what you need, or um, on the other side of the earth. Um, but you need, you know, you need the capability to sustain that. So, you know, you've got to have uh, support capability, a float, and all those kinds of things. I'm not going to get into that naval doctrine discussion here, but I think, I think the viewers can kind of understand that. Um, one of the challenges of navies, however, is that um, if you need to directly influence or affect uh, something that's going on ashore, um, you, you know, there's a, there's a point at which the water becomes too shallow. <laughs> and I think people can appreciate that. Um, if you can't go alongside, uh, if you can't tie up to a pier, um, either because there's been some sort of natural disaster that prevents you from doing so, think of an earthquake in Haiti or something like that, or because you're being denied access um, because an opponent is is telling you, no, you cannot come in here and we're not going to let you come in here. Then you've got some challenges on your hands. Now, one, the, 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 op, the opposed um, scenario is a very high end scenario. And there's only a few navies in the world that are actually capable of doing that. Um, and that the, the lead navy obviously being the United States Navy. But the ability to um, put stuff ashore, 
uh, as you said, humanitarian relief, all that kind of stuff, even in a domestic context. So think of the kinds of natural disasters we've been experiencing in Canada in the last few years. Think of um, the isolated nature of uh, much of Canada's Arctic, for example. Um, the ability to, you can go up there um, and, 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 then, and then you're in the worst scenario possible. You're physically there, but you can't do anything because you can't get ashore. Um, and you, you need certain capabilities to be able to get ashore. Obviously, you know, you need aircraft, helicopters, you need um, uh, vessels, smaller vessels, boats, landing craft, those kinds of things. Now, so in the Canadian context, we've had this debate a couple of times in, in my career about, you know, what kind of um, capability we should have to um, either project power or just project um, capability, even a humanitarian relief capability, as you described it. The, we, we've tried to incorporate very small bits of that into the new ships that are being um, constructed. And uh, I think that, 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 is, that that's worth recognizing, but it is, um, it, it's really just the tip of the iceberg in some respects. It, it, it is a very limited uh, set of capabilities. So to your question, um, would it make sense for Canada to have um, some sort of large ship? Typically, they're, they have a flat top. They look like aircraft carriers, but they're not aircraft carriers. Um, in the sense that they're not Top Gun style, you know, uh, carriers. Um, yeah, it would. And, and, and uh, the challenge always comes down to at what cost. Um, and, and so, you know, would this be instead of something else would be the argument of most um, people involved in the conversation, either uh, within the uniform service or, arguably within the bureaucracy and machinery of government. So, well, what are you not going to have in order to have these? And, and that becomes, um, sadly, part of the start point for the conversation. Um, you know, look at Australia, for example. Um, Australia has, uh, has decided uh, about a decade or so ago that they needed this capability. They built two um, landing ships, um, that carry helicopters, they carry landing craft, they carry, they can carry soldiers, and they can do humanitarian relief. They can evacuate people, they can put people ashore, they can do all these kinds of things. And they've done it because they believe that this is an important uh, tool in, in what is a growing toolbox um, that Australia believes it needs as a country. Um, the, the problem we have in the Canadian defense discussion space is, um, first of all, um, not everybody can agree on the need. Um, and then even if you can agree on the need, uh, then it becomes an issue of priority. And uh, there's so many conflicting and competing priorities that a capability like this is seen to be uh, overly ambitious. And therefore, it, it very rapidly gets pushed aside. Um, we were very close uh, under the previous government, um, and I think it was the right place to go. Um, but that's obviously an issue of personal opinion. Um, and uh, I think it's the right place to go for the very reasons that you laid out. Is it worth having that conversation again? Maybe. But here's the problem. Do you want to have that debate at the same time that you're trying to convince the same government that you need a new fleet of submarines? Um, and, and these are, sadly, these are the types of um, trade-offs that um, the military leadership and the defense and security leadership are, are forced to make on an ongoing basis. So uh, the short answer, absolutely. It, 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 it makes perfect sense for us domestically. It makes perfect sense for us in the context of continental um, defense, security, and, and safety. Um, and internationally, um, 
it would be a, a complete uh, force multiplier and game changer. But um, where does it fit in the grand scheme of things with all the other challenges that we're facing? The reality is most people would see it as a luxury and unnecessary. Um, uh, and, and that is, um, that's sad and unfortunate. Admiral, a number of studies have promulgated that Canada's naval forces are simply too small for a country of our magnitude. A number of studies uh, ha have undertaken comparing the RCN to other navies taking into account population, maritime responsibility, capabilities, defense spending, and gross domestic product. In doing so, these studies have clearly demonstrated how the Royal Canadian Navy is at least half of the strength that it should be. As a maritime nation, the situation calls out for a more equitable voice in security and defense discussions within the Canada's unified forces structure and indeed within government. As a former commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, would you agree with this? And if so, how can we address this situation? Well, I do agree with it. Uh, I agreed with it when I was serving, uh, and I agree with it now that I'm retired. Um, I mean, there's 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 probably three different perspectives from which we can we can approach this discussion, but but I'll, I'll try to keep it as as uh, pointed and straightforward as I can. Um, well, look, the, there is a litany of research. Uh, analysis, um, academically sound uh, research work, et cetera, et cetera, that, that says that, you know, if you just looked at it purely from the perspective of the size of our backyard, <laughs> I use that, and, you know, we have, we, we, we just don't have enough. Um, and we don't have enough ships. We don't have enough people. Um, and, um, and, 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 that those are manifestations of, of the point that you're making in your question, which is that it's it's too small. Um, and uh, um, so, so, you know, but that's a retired sailor giving you that um, analysis. Um, if you're not a retired sailor and you don't really understand or appreciate how it all works and why it's important, then it comes back to this this. Uh, recurring theme of well, how much is enough? Um, and um, certainly, in my experience, um, politicians and um, uh, senior uh, bureaucrats are seldom convinced uh, of the merits of arguments as it relates to military capability. Um, whether they are prepared to embrace uh, some of the principles that are around um, the analysis that leads to these conclusions or not, that, that's problem number one. Problem number two is even if they were inclined to understand or accept the intellectual framework by which these, uh, these conclusions are reached, um, fundamentally, they just come back to, um, well, that's all fine, but this is all the money you have, or this is all the money we're going to give you. So, you know, stop adding things to the list of stuff that we can't afford. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the, but, but this is not exclusive to Canada. It just, the scale is different. And I think what's disappointing, certainly frustrating um, in the Canadian context is that although I, I, fully acknowledge um, the recurring themes that most of our allies are dealing with. Um, the, the reality is that there doesn't appear to be any pressure other than inside the, inside the defense apparatus itself to, to push the issue or to uh, force the awkward conversation. It's like, that it's almost as if it, it, it it's accepted from the outset as being a non-starter. Therefore, well, let's not waste anybody's time because we're just not going to go there. Um, and and we get into the, these chicken and egg situations, and we're we're seeing it play out right now, where um, naysayers would argue, 
and, and it's a difficult place for the leadership of the Navy, for example, to be in when they're, they're short, you know, I don't know, pick a number, um, thousands of sailors. And the problem with the number itself is it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you a, rep, a, a relative representation of how significant a shortfall that is. If you said to somebody, well, you got a thousand, you're a thousand down on a number. So is that a thousand empty seats in um, the uh, uh, Canadian Tire Center for a Senator's game? Is that a big deal or not a big deal? Um, well, when you're a thousand down on a um, operational uh, community of less than 10,000 um, and you accept there's a whole bunch of other things that are going on behind the scenes that restrict the availability of that remaining 9,000 people, well, you're probably dealing with seven or 8,000 out of 10,000. Well, now you've got a real problem. Um, and, and and that's the kind of context that this is playing out. So um, without rambling too much, um, the, the chicken and egg dimension of this is say, well, it, if you're down 25 or 30 percent on your on where you're supposed to be, then how are you going to crew all these new ships that you're supposed to be building in the first place? And then it becomes it, it just becomes a self perpetuating argument. Um, and uh, the, the, these are the types of um, discussions that play out behind the scenes and that cause people no end of grief on both sides of the debate um, and make it very, very difficult for um, any sort of sustainable long-term plan that we have to, basically, the force is in decline right now. And I mean by this, the entire armed forces, the Navy is, is just one element of it. It's in decline. It need, we need to arrest the decline. Okay. Then we need to reset the entire structure of the force. And then we need to grow the force into that new reset structure. Um, and, and that is an enormous challenge and a challenge that I, I'm not necessarily seeing um, being fully embraced. Um, it, it's, it's sort of a uh, hope is not a method kind of um, scenario that we're observing right now. It's a long rambling answer to your question. I apologize. Um, but uh, the reality is the entire armed forces of Canada is too small. Uh, it needs to grow and it needs to be more capable. Um, and um, that's easy to say. It's very hard to do. Um, but um, first, you know, it, it's, it's like when, you're, when your boat is, is sinking, the first thing you do is stop the water coming in. Um, okay. And then you figure out the rest of it. Well, I'm not sure we've figured out the equivalent of stopping the water from coming in, um, stopping the, the the loss of people um, and and stabilize the force. And then you can start to build it. But you're not going to fix it in two or three years. It's taken decades to get where we are. It's going to take decades to fix it, which goes back to one of the recurring themes of your great series of questions, which is, you can't do this if your planning horizon is the next election. You have to be looking into decades, um, and you have to commit to decades of um, long-term planning objectives, resourced objectives, um, and um, you know. And, and sadly, I, I we're just we're not willing to do it. We're able to do it. If we chose to do it, we could do it, and we we could we could do this really really well. But we're just not choosing to do it, and and that's the part that really makes me sad. A follow-on question: uh, Last October, the Chief of Defence Staff, uh, General Wayne Eyre, bravely acknowledged what most people in the Canadian Armed Forces have long known that the military is in serious trouble and unable to sustain its current commitments in its present state. Well, uh, what, in your view, has got us into this grave situation? Well, I think we just touched on it in the last uh, session. I, uh, you know, there, there are many contributors to this problem, and they have, um, they, they have accumulated over decades. Um, Benign neglect uh, is, is a term that I've heard frequently to describe 
um, the armed forces in Canada. Um, and, you know, the, the, this really comes down to, you know, first of all, do we really take defense and security seriously or are we just going through the motions? That, that's the first question. Um, and, and I'll let your viewers draw their own conclusions. Uh, the, the second issue then is, OK, if you are going to take this seriously, um, are you going to commit to this uh, for the long haul? Or are you simply going to make some statements, issue some policy direction, and, and then move on to other priorities? Um, and because if you're not prepared to stick to it uh, and really commit to it, then you're, you're not going to achieve anything over the long term. Your own, the only way you're going to achieve a long-term objective is by some sort of luck or divine intervention uh, if you're not actually you know, uh, implementing and resourcing a long-term plan. Um, you know, and, and, and then, you know, there, I mean, there's multiple layers to this, but one of the key problems we're dealing with right now is um, on the people side of things, the, the people need to feel like they're doing something important. And I mean, most most people in the armed forces genuinely believe in what they're doing. Um, that it's more than just a job for you know ninety plus percent of those who who choose to serve in uniform. The, the the real problem, and it's a morale issue, is that when they don't feel appreciated, um, they start to question their own motivation. And so, you know, not only do you have to decide are you serious or not, not only do you have to um, make a long-term commitment to this, but you have to demonstrate um, the commitment. And you need to empower both the people who are going to do it and the Canadians, ultimately, that they're going to serve. And um, because people will not join and they won't stay in an organization if they don't feel um, you know, to put it broke if they're not feeling the love, uh, then they're not they're not going to stick around. And I fear that right now a, a lot of the members of the armed forces are just not feeling the love, and um, and and that means that that uh, sadly, um, you know, they're not committed. And therefore, if you've got real challenges that you're trying to solve, you need people fully committed to that. And it's not their fault that they're not committed because they're just not feeling appreciated. So it's another vicious cycle. And again, I, I, I don't apologize for the meandering nature of, of my reactions. You know, the, the, the chief has it right. Um, and, you know, his, his public statements are, um, are commendable and um, they're accurate. Um, I just fear they might be falling on deaf ears. Admiral, uh, yeah. recently there's been a number of articles in the national and international press uh, relating to the hollowing out or, of the military, particularly Germany, Great Britain, Canada, the United States, and elsewhere. We are facing a recruiting and retention crisis as well as a number of leadership issues that have made become a, essentially a major scandal. What must the government do to address this? I think it goes back to what we've been touching on in, in a few of our, our rounds of this conversation. Um, I mean, the, there needs to be a, an overt expression of leadership that transcends um, short-term objectives. It, it needs to be long-term. It needs to be um, the it needs to be a demonstration of commitment to the institution um, and not just to the problem, fixing problems at the institution, because there's a subtle difference between focusing on um, the issues that, that they're trying to manage um, is not the same thing as focusing on um, why the institution is, is so vital to um, the nation. And, uh, and and that that's that may appear superficially to not be a big difference, but it's a huge difference. Um, 
you know, we've talked about the long-term sustainable funding. I mean, in my obviously very parochial and arguably naive view, um, you know, defense spending should not be uh, a political football. Um, I, I genuinely believe that, that there should be um, a uh, nonpartisan approach to defense and security, but you know that that's that's my opinion. Um, and you know the the, the, the problem. I, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to be very careful here because the, the problem is when defense and security become politicized. When any issue becomes politicized, um, the issue itself um, gets lost in the acrimony of the politicization. Um, and so I guess um, I would plead with not just this government, but any potential Canadian government in whatever form it would take, um, stop politicizing defense. Uh, defense and security are fundamental to the, the vitality of our country and stop turning them into um, issues where uh, one party is trying to outwit or outplay uh, another. Um, and that I'm more than prepared to be considered naive uh, in that context, but I genuinely believe that. I believe it now uh, at this stage in my life as much as I believed it when I was 17 and I joined the Naval Reserve. Um, I, you know, defense and security are just foundational. And I, I think they're becoming increasingly important to um, the future of, of our way of life. Um, and I believe, uh, to the premise of your question, that, that we're seeing um, a significant erosion of capability, not just in Canada, but amongst our key allies. And I think that that um, is potentially problematic especially when we look at um, what are arguably the unforeseen events uh, in Ukraine, uh, which some people foresaw and others chose to ignore, and um, the potential threat um, that, that we just can no longer ignore as it relates to um, the ongoing provocations of China. So there you go. Admiral, on behalf of Policy Insights Forum, thank you for your candid interview. As Canadians, we greatly appreciate your time in uniform. And on a more personal note, thank you for your time to enlighten us on naval issues and matters. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tyon, Colonel Paul. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I appreciate you, your interest in, uh, in naval issues uh, affecting Canada and more globally affecting our uh, our friends and allies. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good day.